This morning, if you would take your Bibles with me, we're going to start in Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 36 this morning. Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 36. It says, Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went down to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. And she kissed him. She kissed his feet and anointed them with fragrant oil. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself, saying, If this man were a prophet, he would know who, what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, Teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50 when they had nothing which to repay him, he freely forgave both. Tell me, therefore, which one of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, You have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Then he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. It's a beautiful story in Scripture, isn't it? We see this here in Luke. You've got a, a, a lady who comes to Jesus. She's known as a sinful woman. Everybody knows her that way. The Pharisee recognized instantly this, man is, this woman is not who she's supposed to be. And yet here she is. And not just at Jesus' feet, but in a Pharisee's house nonetheless. That's amazing to me. This woman, when she looked at Jesus, and her desire to be different was so strong, nothing would stop her. She went to the one place she knew she would be judged, she'd be ridiculed, She'd be scorned, probably even thrown out of the house. She didn't care. She looked straight at Jesus and said, I want to be changed. I want to be different. As a matter of fact, she did something that at that time and even today would be unheard of. We know from other gospel accounts that this woman, the fragrant oil she had, was worth a year's wages. Very expensive fragrant oil. Very expensive. So expensive, in fact, that Judas, one of the disciples of Christ, scorned her and said she should have sold this. This should have been sold so we could feed the poor. But here this woman, she wanted change so badly that she did something that was unheard of. She gave up her wealth. She put herself in a position of judgment. She went to people who did not care for her just to get to Jesus. Because she wanted to be different. I ask myself when I read this story, I wonder what my level of desire is to be different than who I am today. You know, this desire she had, it wasn't something where she said, I just don't like what I did today. I'm disappointed in the decisions I make. It was desperation. It was, I have to change today or else I am stuck in a place that I cannot stand to be anymore. I have to be different. And here she goes in. You've got the Pharisees. You've got how they're dressed. You've got, you've got all the pomp and circumstance around. And she gets down 
on her hands and knees, and she goes to Jesus. But she doesn't hug him. She doesn't feel worthy to do that. She doesn't tap him on the shoulder to talk to him. But she gets down on the floor, weeping, and she pours out all this expensive oil on his feet. She doesn't even ask for forgiveness at this point. She's just weeping so much, she just washes his feet. This tells me a couple things. It tells me the woman's condition, but it also tells me how God can see directly into our heart. You know, the Bible says that there are prayers that we can't even utter. That prayers that are so deep inside of us, we can't even speak the words. But God hears them just the same. And God, upon looking at this woman, He turns to Simon and He says, let me pose a story to you. Let me, let me just ask you a story. And it's, it's amazing to me. You know, we see something happening in front of us. We don't understand it. Then Jesus says, let me tell you a story. And all of a sudden, it becomes clear. He says, you got one debtor that owes you just a little bit of money. You, you owe him just a little bit. You got another one that owes you a great deal. Hundreds of dollars. Both are forgiven. Who do you love more? Here's what Jesus is saying. You may recognize that you've fallen short in a few areas of your life. This woman recognizes that on her best day, she was not worthy to be near me. Here she is weeping and sobbing and anointing my feet, knowing that her sins are great. Do you think she will love me more because she knows how much there is to be forgiven? When posed in such a manner, Simon thinks it's obvious. He says, of course, the one who owes you more is going to forgive you more. So Jesus says, I want you to look at this woman because that's what you're seeing right here in front of you. Church, sometimes we forget. We see people come to Christ and we remember exactly what's going on in their life and we say, no, that, I know that person. I'm not sure I buy this. Well, here's the thing. Repentance brings a blessing. You can't repent if there's nothing to repent of or if you refuse to acknowledge that there's something to get rid of. Every one of us are guilty on our best day we are this woman before christ on our best day we still have a lot to be forgiven of and here she comes broken before the feet of jesus she's not a pharisee she doesn't look the part she's not holy in any way she just comes saying i am not worthy but i need you and she falls at the feet of jesus and anoints him and calls out to him in her heart and god hears her prayer i tell you that's what's missing in churches all across this country is to stop making excuses for how we live and start pouring it out before God as an offering, saying, God, I'm sorry, I need you. I need you. My goodness, we come up with a lot of excuses. We say, well, I am as God made me. Let me change that just a little bit. I am as Adam fell. I'm flawed. I'm sin. I have a lot of problems. And I can make excuses all day long, but unless I come and fall at the feet of Jesus, I'm not ready to meet Him. I'm not ready. It's sad that here Jesus was in a Pharisee's house, a religious elitist, someone who's been trained and taught the law, but salvation came to a harlot who anointed the feet of Jesus and not to the Pharisee who's sitting across the table from the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That is sad. That is such a sad part in this story that someone could be so close to salvation and yet miss it completely while another wasn't even invited to the table and finds what everyone else missed. If we go on further in this story, you go down to verse 49 and 48, or 50, excuse me. It says, Then those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Then he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. You know, you ask yourself, why did Jesus say your faith has saved you? Well, you have to remember who she put her faith in. See, it's not just random faith alone that saves you. You can't just have faith in anything just willy-nilly and say, I have faith, so I'm good. No, her faith was in Jesus Christ. She didn't anoint the Pharisees' feet. She didn't go and find a rich man and anoint his feet. She didn't go to anyone else. She sought out 
Jesus. Her faith was in Jesus. And that faith in Jesus is what saved her. I've had people ask the question many times throughout my life. They've asked the question. They've said, well, you know, Pastor, if I'm, if I'm saved when I'm younger, well, then I'm, I'm good from now on, right? Let me tell you something. If you've stopped pursuing Jesus, you're not okay. If you've stopped trying to be like Christ, you're not okay. If you're looking for an excuse for sin in your life, you're not okay. If you think you're better than everybody else in the room, you're not okay. Because all these things point to evidence of flaws and failures in our lives. Every single one of them. And when there's a flaw or a failure, there's only one way to fix it, and that's repentance. Coming to the feet of Christ and calling out to Him. I can't stop pursuing Jesus and then say, I'm okay. I got saved when I was seven. If I was saved at the age of seven, then I should be growing in Christ every single day. I should desire Him. I should be in love with Him. I should be praying to Him. I should be learning more about Him. I should be building a relationship with Him. I remember I heard a joke one time regarding marriage. And about this old couple sitting in their living room one night. They've been married for many, many, many years. And the man did what he always did. He grabbed his paper, sat in his favorite chair, and he's reading his paper. And his wife, she kind of, she starts to get mad at him. And so finally, she grabs the paper and yanks it down and looks at her husband. She goes, why don't you tell me you ever love me anymore? The man takes the paper, he folds it neatly, puts it on the table next to him. He said, I told you once, if anything should ever change, I'll let you know. Sometimes we have a similar attitude when it comes to God. Say, I told you I love you once, if anything changes, I'll let you know. Folks, that's not a healthy relationship with Jesus Christ. That's not going to fix what's going on in your life. If it's not good enough for your marriage, it's certainly not good enough for Jesus. And when you look at this woman, she calls out to God saying, I know who and what I am. I need you. I need you. You go on over to Luke chapter 5, verses, verses 29 through 32. And it says, Then Levi gave him a great feast in his own house. And there was a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with them. And their scribes and Pharisees complained against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You know, this, this little clip in Scripture right here, these few verses, I've heard people say many times, so well, Jesus ate with sinners and tax collectors and all these different people, so that's good, right? Jesus didn't tell them they could continue to be the way they are. Jesus demands a change. Look at the Scripture again. Jesus explains, they ask, why are you sitting with tax collectors, with sinners, with all these different people? And He tells them, He says, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. So He says, these people have a disease! They have a disease. It's called sin. And he said, I've not come to call the righteous but sinners. He said, I'm here because they need me. Because they've got sin in their life because they need me. He's not telling them you're okay, I'm okay, we're all okay. He's not saying there's no need to get things right. He's saying, I've come to share with you the Gospel. I'm here to tell you that there's a better way. I'm here to tell you it's time that you lay down the things that are dragging you down and start reaching up for the one thing that's going to pull you up. That's Me. It's time to surrender to Me. And that's the one thing as a church we've missed over the years. We've missed it. We've wanted to be loved by the world and by so many people that we've gotten the attitude, I'm, I'm okay, you're okay, we're all okay, let's sing praises to Jesus and we're all good. Church, that's not the mission. That's not the mission. The mission is to go out into the world and let them know that there is a thing called sin. And it brings with it a price, a hefty price. A price that you do not want 
to pay. And it's time to get things right with Jesus Christ. Repentance brings about a blessing. A blessing. Our children, one lesson that we teach our kids regularly is when they do something wrong, when they offend one another, or they do something they shouldn't be doing, that the number one thing they do, the first thing they have to do is go to each other and apologize and make it right. Number one, they know you're still going to get punished, you're still going to get in trouble, but before we ever get to that phase, go to each other and make it right. When I sin, when I do something I should not be doing, the first thing I should be doing is getting on my knees and apologizing to God and asking for His forgiveness. That's number one. Because I can't love as I'm called to love if I'm not walking with Jesus in the manner I should be. I cannot have peace if I'm not walking with the Lord the way I should be. I lose out on everything if my relationship with Jesus suffers. That's why he says, I'm eating with tax collectors and sinners. I'm spending time with them for one reason and one reason only. They need a physician. They need help. And I'm the one that's going to help them. I'm the one that's going to share the truth with them. That's what the Pharisees should have been doing from day one. But they didn't. That's what we need to be doing as Christian believers is sharing the truth of Jesus Christ. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, Go ahead and turn there with me in 1 Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Timothy's a young preacher. He's got a lot of challenges. And this is what Paul tells Timothy. He says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at His appearing, preach the Word. Be ready to convince, be ready in season and out of season, to convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine but according to their own desires because they have itching ears they will heap up for themselves teachers let's pause here for just a moment here timothy is a young preacher he's he's trying to build his church and today in today's society, we're told a lot of things to build churches. We're told programs, different things to do. But the one thing that Paul told Timothy, the one thing that stood above everything else, was to preach the Word. Preach the Word. He tells Timothy, be ready in season and out of season. And then he tells him, this is what preaching the Word means. He says, when I tell you to preach the Word, here's what I'm telling you. To rebuke. To exhort. To teach. With all long suffering." Not necessarily things that we want to hear, but things that are necessary for growth in the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're necessary. Because the Word discovers our true condition. The one thing that we can't find in ourselves, the Word points it out for us. And it's painful. We love to hear the happy, clappy, sing-along sermons, and we think, boy, that was fantastic. I needed that this week. Well, sometimes we do need that. But sometimes what I need more than anything else is for God to reach deep inside of me and show me, you know why you've had a bad week? This is what's been going on. This is what you need. This is what you need. I just had to have a talk with my kids just this week. They had a fight with each other. A couple of them got hurt. And so I had to have a long talk with them. And I sat down and I explained to them why this behavior was wrong, why we can't do it anymore. And they're all, yeah, yeah, Dad, you're right. You're, you're right. So I told them, I said, I'm, I'm still, go- still got to punish you. I said, I, I still got to lay down the law here. And they look at me and they say, Dad, but why? I said, because I want to get it through your head that this behavior is not good because when you're older, the consequences are greater. If we don't get this resolved now when you're younger, guys, it's going to get worse as you get older. We've got to take care of it now. Why is Paul telling Timothy to preach the Word of God when he tells him that times are going to get worse? Because if the church can't learn these lessons now in its infancy, the church won't be there when the times get harder. It'll fall apart. How will you and I stand as time passes how will we stand 
when we've got these people coming in that are struggling in life and they need answers and we have none to give unless we build ourselves up first in the Word of God and in prayer. We build ourselves up in the knowledge and the faith of Jesus Christ so that when we sit down with people who are hurting, we can share with them the hope of God and lead them to a place where repentance comes and brings the blessing that it can. That's why Paul told Timothy, preach the Word, and when you preach it, be sure that you are doing all that's required according to the law. That you rebuke the behavior that brings about a curse. That you teach people how to live according to God's holy Word. Not to be in oppression, but to live in victory. To exhort them, to press them, to go forward and do the things that God commands for us to do. That's what preaching is. That's what preaching is. It's not oppression. It's finding victory in Jesus Christ. Victory over those things that steal our joy and our peace from us. Victory. My kids, they, know, they think they know exactly what's good for them. We go into Walmart. But Walmart's not a good place. It tests your faith. It really does. It tests Christianity and everything else. You go into Walmart with kids and you're going through the checkout line and they're hungry. Guess what kids start doing? They get the I want syndrome. They're grabbing Snicker bars and Kit Kat and Hershey. They're grabbing all the sugar stuff going through there. Dad, I'm starving. It's like, kids, put that up. Put that up. You got the cashier looking at you. <laughs> I'm godly. I'm a, I'm a Christian. I really am. Kids, put it up. Put it up. Put it up. They put it up. You get out to the car. It's like, Dad, why can't I have this? Say, kids, listen, we're going to go home. Mom's got a good meal plan. It's going to be great. We're going to have a wonderful meal. You eat that stuff, you're going to get cavities. It's going to be bad. Then you've got to go to the dentist and all this stuff. No, no, we're not doing that. But I'm hungry. And now they're mad at you because you told them no. Then we get home. And they get the meal. They look at you. Boy, Dad, that was delicious. I was starving. Like, I know. That's why I told you to wait. Timothy is given a charge to preach because there's going to come a time when we all get the I wants. And we see all the things that look good on the outside and we want them. We want them right now. And we're grabbing them. We're grabbing it all. And Timothy's being told, you're going to have to rebuke. You're going to have to teach. You're going to have to grow them in the Lord. Because when you do that, Timothy, you're preparing them to stand when it's going to be very, very hard to stand. When you've got doctrines coming in telling them one thing and you're telling them another, you've got to give them an anchor to know how to stand. That's the challenge of the church. When Mary Magdalene, when Mary heard all these things that were going on, when she heard the teachings of Jesus, something inside of her responded. Something inside of her said, this is what I need. This is what I need. I didn't need the, the, the philosophies or the doctrines or man's teaching. I didn't need that. What Jesus is saying, that's what I need. And she ran into a place where they would judge her and ridicule her because Jesus was in the house. And she fell on her hands and knees weeping and brushing His feet saying, I know I'm not welcome. I know I'm not wanted. I know I'm not needed. But Jesus, I need You. Whether You need me or not, I need You. And she's pouring out her heart and soul before God. And Jesus says, this is what I'm looking for. This is why I came into the world. He sits down with tax collectors and sinners. And he's looking at all of them and all the things they do. And he's telling them, he says, I want to give you the answer to life. I want to tell you how things get better. I want to tell you why I came into the world. And the Pharisees look at him and say, why are you wasting your time? He says, because I love them. I love all of you, but these are listening to me. So I'm going to share with them the hope and the gospel that I've come to bring. And then Paul looks at Timothy and he says, what Jesus did, you do too. How the world rejected Christ, so they will reject you too. But Timothy, you preach the Word. You preach the Word. You give them repentance. You give them hope. You preach the Word. 
And that's the challenge for the church today is that we preach the Word, but also that we act out the Word. And that means repenting of our sins and who and what we are and giving it to Christ that we may live new in Him. We go on to the next verse. I'll close with this next one. But 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter... No, oh, I was in 2 Timothy. Go on over to 1 Timothy chapter 4. We'll just jump jump backwards a little bit. 1 Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 1. It says, Now the Spirit expressively says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared as with a hot iron. That's a sad couple verses right there. I'm going to work backwards for a minute. You look at verse 2. Having your own conscience seared as with a hot iron. How do you get to that point? Did you ever burn yourself really bad? I remember when I was a little kid, my parents, they, they had the stove on. Mom was cooking. And I was just a little baby. Mom was holding me. And as she was holding me, working in the kitchen, doing multitasking, doing the things that Mom did, my little foot got right on the burner. Burn my foot! I couldn't feel a thing for a long time where that, that stove touched me. It burned me. It burned me hard. The Bible says that there will come a point where people get so used to sin that their conscience will get so hard, so numb, that they won't feel conviction anymore. Be seared as with a hot iron. You know, the Bible gives us an example of this even in the Old Testament. It says that Lot pitched his tent near Sodom and Gomorrah. When the angels came to call Lot out, it tells us that his righteous spirit was oppressed day by day by both hearing and seeing. Notice it says not participating, but hearing and seeing their wicked deeds. It oppressed him. In some ways, even seared his conscience. He still heard the voice of God. The Bible still considered him righteous, but it affected him. He didn't come out without effect. When we live in this world in such a wicked time, it will have an effect on you if you're not careful. If you're not walking with the Lord, taking your faith seriously, if you're not digging in your words, spending time in prayer, arming yourself up, it will have an effect on you. And you need to be sharp in the Word of God to be able to stand in those times. Look at verse 1. It says that some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. That means, that tells me right there, there's going to be a lot of people that say they believe in Jesus and they have no idea why. No idea why. We believe because grandma believed, because mom and dad believed. We believe because we're told to believe. We don't have a relationship with Jesus. We have no idea why we're doing what we're doing. And it says that other doctrines, deceiving spirits, doctrines of demons are going to come in and deceive many and lead them away. Church, this is why repentance is so important. This is why having Christ in your heart is so important. When Mary heard the words of God, she responded and she said, Get this off of me! I can't carry this burden anymore! Get it off of me! And she cried out to the Lord Jesus Christ. She became a new person in him when you become a new person in jesus and you start building up that spiritual walk with god boy sin gets distasteful it starts tasting awful it starts looking awful when you get neck deep in it all you can think is about getting out from it getting away from it because god is telling you this is not good this is dangerous this is bad get away from it that's what we see with Mary. That's what we see with the tax collectors and the sinners. God exposed their condition. They went out of it. But there comes a point sometimes where pride sets in for the Christian. And we get so hard-hearted when we're not walking where we should be. We get so hard-hearted that we say, I'm okay. I go to church. I go to church. Church does not save you. You say, I listen to Spirit 95. I listen to the godly music doesn't save you doesn't save you i'll never forget 
music can start getting ready. I'll never forget, my dad was preaching a sermon one time at a little bitty country church, little bitty church out in the middle of nowhere, Bono, Indiana, little bitty church. And he'd preach every Sunday. Same people would come. Every Sunday he'd preach. This one particular Sunday he was preaching. And an old man named Leo, I'll never forget him. He had one hair in the middle of his head, one long hair in the middle of his head, dead center. And at the altar call, Leo came up, and Dad looked at him, comes down to, from the altar to pray with Leo. Leo was over 80 years old. He looked at my dad, he said, Lindy, he said, you know, throughout my life, I have served in every single position except pastor in this church. He said, I've been a Sunday school teacher. He taught other people the Bible stories we grew up with. He said, I've been a deacon in this church. He said, I've done it all. But he said, Lindy, he said, I realized this morning as you were preaching, I have never asked Jesus Christ to be my Lord and my Savior. And I need Him today. I need Him today. This man did it all. He studied the Bible. He taught the Bible. He led in the church. He did it all. But he never asked Jesus to be his personal Lord and Savior. God was calling Leo's name. It wasn't even a week later. Leo, every morning, he'd have a bag of peanuts. He'd walk down the street. He would have his morning constitutional. He'd walk. That morning as he was walking, the Lord called him home. He was found on the side of the road still clutching his bag of peanuts. If he had not responded to the voice of God just a few days before, he would not have been ready when God called his name. That's why these scriptures are so important. It says when pride sets in, when pride sets in, when we start saying, I'm okay, I don't need to repent, I've done my bit, I've gone to church, I've done everything I need to do. Folks, you're listening, you're buying into a lie. You're buying into a lie. Yesterday's good is not good enough for today. Yesterday's good is not good enough for today. My faith in Jesus needs to be, be renewed day by day. I need to sharpen it. Day by day, I need to grow in it. Day by day, I need to know more about Jesus Christ. Because I love Him. I don't want to be the husband that sits back and says, if anything changes, I'll let you know later. I don't want to be the guy that got so comfortable when I was a child that I've not done anything since I was a child in my service for Jesus Christ. I don't want to sit with tax collectors and sinners and be comfortable and never mention the name of Jesus Christ. He came to seek and save that which was lost. I want to live, breathe, glow, eat, speak the Word and name of Jesus Christ. I want it to come out of me everywhere I go. I want revival to follow behind me when I walk into a room. I want to see people get right with God, repent of their sins, and be ready when God calls their name. That doesn't happen by playing church. It doesn't happen by pretending to be what we claim to be. It claims by being changed in Jesus Christ. Being that woman that comes to Christ in a place that makes her incredibly uncomfortable, but going there and falling on her hands and knees it's saying, God, will you remember me? Will you remember me? This woman did nothing right her entire life. Scholars tell us she was a prostitute. She had done many things that were unholy in her, in her life. And here she is at the feet of Jesus. Just wiping His feet. Saying, God, will you remember me? Will you remember me? I've read about several revivals that have broken out in our country over the last year. And every single one of them started with one thing. One thing. Repentance. People falling on their knees before God Almighty. And saying, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for what I've done. 
I'm sorry for who I've been. God, I'm sorry. When you realize what sin is, it's painful. Oh, it's painful. You think about Jesus on that cross. When I've got sin in my life, and I'm not asked God to take it, basically get this in your mind. I am the Roman soldier. Christ is laying on the cross and holding out His hand. And I'm the one hammering the nail in place. I'm responsible for Him hanging there. Stand back and look what our sin did. A man bleeding and dying on a cross at Calvary. He wouldn't be there if I could have just done what I needed to do. But I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. When Jesus looked at this woman, He was telling her, I've got it taken care of. I'll cover your sins. I'll pay for them before God the Father. Daughter, you're okay. I came to take care of this. Your faith in me has saved you. Go in peace. The sacrificial lamb, he took her sins and he said, I'll pay the price. The tax collectors and the sinners, he said, I'll pay the price for you too. Taking the sins one by one, taking them from all. And he says, All I ask, all I ask of my church, all I ask of those who will believe in me is that you come and humble yourself before my cross and say, I'm sorry. I believe. I believe. I believe in a God of Calvary. I believe that Jesus came and was born of a virgin. I believe that He ministered on this earth for three years. I believe. I believe that He performed the miracles I believe with all my heart that He was beaten for me. I believe with all my heart He died having me on His mind. And I believe with all my heart that He came out of the grave and He lives today. Now to my church and to those visiting, I ask you this one simple question. It's a simple one. Do you believe in Jesus Christ this morning with all your heart with all your soul with all your mind do you believe have you been living for Jesus Christ have you said no to sin in the ways of this world whatever the answer I'm going to ask you come to an altar and either praise God for His forgiveness and mercy or call out and ask Him for His love and His mercy. But either way, it's time to repent. It's time to bring it before God the Father because one day He's going to return. And when He does, when He does, it's only what we've done right now beforehand that's going to matter. Whatever need you have, whatever prayer you need to pray for anything God has laid on your heart this morning, this altar is open for you. I invite you this morning, whatever need you have, whatever prayer you need to pray, I invite you. Please come.